I probably have started over 10 businesses, and uh, if I had to count, you know, maybe seven failures, three successes. His name is Nick Newsom, your best friend in communication software. For over 20 years, he's been helping businesses communicate better with their customers. If you purposely choose something that you're passionate about, you want to absorb more information, and it's actually fun to you, and you, you want to research it, you want to be the best, you want to learn more, you understand that you're not the expert, but you want to become the expert. So you do that hard work and that research to do that, right? You got to be passionate, especially when you're young, passionate about what you're doing. And if you're not passionate about it, you should probably switch jobs. I think of another shortcut to be enthusiastic and passionate is, wow, boom. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Unlock Your Potential. Jeff Florida, your host, always riveted to be back with you, having amazing conversations with amazing human beings as we plumb the depths of outlier success and try to find those common traits that make ridiculously successful people ridiculously successful so that the rest of us can try to have our slice, too. On that note, I am excited to welcome my very, very good friend, Nick Newsom. This is another one of those, and we've had a few as fans of the show. No, one of those episodes where... I invite one of my really successful entrepreneurial friends onto the show and we basically catch up like we in our busy entrepreneurial lives don't often enough have time to do and we let everybody listen. So that's what this is. His name is Nick Newsom. His official bio will tell you that he's your best friend in communication software. For over 20 years, he's been helping businesses communicate better with their customers. Crazy cool feature set, brandy caller ID, call remediation, contact center software, communication APIs, modern phone system solutions. Comprehensive communication and collaboration tools you need. Flux capacitor repair. I think he's currently working on cold fusion. He was in crypto way before it was cool. And so much more. Nick, I'm not like, I'm not going to do you the injustice of only reading your stock bio because uh, it's so much more nuanced and interesting and diverse and frankly fun than that. Uh, but I will just sum it up as saying like, you're a really cool nerd. Does that offend you? No. I like being a nerd. A cool, I've been, really cool nerd. I, yeah. I mean, like, if I was in high school, you know, I think nerds are cool now. So that would be a, a big, good category. It's to totally end. flipped, by the way, right? It has. It I has. feel like if you're a really good high school athlete right now, on, like only the majority that aren't actually going to like play pro sports, then you're at risk of peaking in high school. True. You probably find something else to get good at. Yeah. I think uh, nerd is uh, the new cool for sure. It is. Well, dude, welcome to the show. So glad you're here, dude. Yeah, thank you. And by the way, crypto, I don't think is very cool anymore. I, uh, oh, that's not cool. You were, you did it before it was cool. I imagine wrote it when it was cool and probably. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, you know, have like a huge success with it, but I kind of like playing with blockchain and all that kind of stuff. But what kind of got me out of it were the numbers, meaning that, you know, the total market cap of crypto is what, just around a trillion dollars or something like that. And you look at like U.S. consumer debt, and that's one point two trillion dollars, and just credit card debt. So, like, if you think about the world stage and you know macro economies, uh, crypto is so small. And I just, I yeah, think US something GDP else GDP bigger is going on. U.S. GDP now is like, I don't even know. It's like tens of trillions. Yeah. So it's just. 30, yeah. Yeah. Just for for people, you know, honestly, it, it kind of makes me cringe when I get like pitched on a uh, crypto startup or company. And it's like, listen, use blockchain, do your thing, have frictionless transactions and all that kind of stuff. But you got to be providing a value utility, something there. So well, I've well, kind of decided to get out of that. Let me just tell you, you probably don't know this. You were actually the first. And the reason I immediately referenced that in, in reading your bio or improvising your bio is because you're actually the first person that clued me into Bitcoin. And you really, but, yeah. but it was an, it was a co an offhand comment you made in a meeting one time about how you had some, you were using, I think your excess computing bandwidth at Whitetail's offices to move yeah. Bitcoin. Yes. It was like, I don't know what those words meant. This was like at least 10 years ago, but I'm going to go learn what those words meant. And that was actually my first intro to, to group. Yeah. Yeah. And then I almost caught the building on fire. Oh, look, which is yeah, not cool. I heard they produce a little bit of heat. Yeah, they produce a little bit of heat. I was pulling a little too much uh, free electricity uh, from my uh, full service gross lease. Right. And uh, we were burning away at those uh, miners and uh, my employees but, were looking at me like, what is going on over in that room? And I was like, oh, we're just mining some crypto over here. You know, nothing to see. 
And uh, so we we kind of said, well, let's just focus on our primary business. And uh, you know, that was a good thing. So let's talk a little bit about your primary business. Not so much like what you do, although I want to talk about that, but I want to like roll back the clock to, because I, th- I from the bits that I've heard, really interesting story, uh, some of which I would encourage you to share publicly. Yeah, yeah. Like how you, I'm, how you I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty transparent. Most most people that know me kind of know the story, but uh, let's see. I've I've probably have started over ten businesses, and uh, if I had to count, you know, maybe seven failures, three successes. Um, so prior to Ytel, I owned a company called F9 Group, uh, which I sold, and then had the fortunate experience to actually buy back, mm. and that provided enough cash flow to actually start. Um, why tell with my own seed funding? So I didn't need to go out there and get investors and that kind of thing. And really the whole point behind why tell um, was I was sending business to much bigger companies to, you know, do call center software and IVRs and automation. And, you know, we have some patents on stuff like that. And these bigger companies couldn't keep up with our sales volume. So we're like, Hey, let's start our own company, do this ourselves, and service our own customers. So we did that. And we just like super focused on customers. I remember when we had less than a hundred customers, we would sit there on the weekends and actually wait for customers to submit like a sales inquiry, a support ticket or whatever. And we'd like wait there like Saturday night when one would come in and we'd be so excited to just talk to a customer. And so we'd like, you know, email, get on the phone with the customer, help them out. And they were like, you know, it's Saturday night. I was expecting a call on like Monday to handle this. And we're like, no, no, we just want to help you. So that's really ingrained in our culture. Super fun. And, and when, and when was this, by the way? When, uh, this was 2000, 2012. Okay, so yeah, it's been okay, about I years. found you. I met you in two thousand thirteen. Yeah, so you're you were right there, probably in that first one hundred bucket. Okay, we we're just kind of starting all this and very personable, right? Yeah. So I'll look at, for for audience context. So Nick's company Whitel was our telephony service provider at my old agencies early that I ran from. 2013 to 20. Yeah. You came up to our office. I remember that. We were oh, upstairs yeah. up there. That, that's oh, when yeah. we almost burned down with the Bitcoin miner. <laughs> but I was in what? R- RSM, right? Yeah. Yeah. Rancho Santa Margarita. Okay. So anyway. Uh, yeah. So um, basically we got to a hundred customers. Um, at that point we were actually profitable and doing pretty well. So we just put all that net profit back in the business, kept stacking and growing the business. And that took us forward until about uh, 2016 when we took a Series A investment. It was kind of unique because we really didn't need the money, but I really wanted to access uh, private equity to kind of see what that world was like. Um, We wanted to accelerate our R&D efforts. We wanted to build a new uh, API platform. There's this little company called Twilio out there. We wanted to do some of the same things. So um, we took a Series A minority investment, um, put that into the business and just, man, we just put the, you know, gas pedal down. Um, did you ever come to my my big warehouse building? Did you ever see that one? I don't know if you did. I don't think I did. I don't think I, yeah. I think I've only been, been to your office twice and it would have been 13 and then maybe again in 14 or 15. Yeah. Okay. So af- after that in um, probably like that was 2019, um, we got this huge warehouse and we had containers and um, just everything to matter, full kitchen, catering every day. Um, you know, we're kind of, had to compete against the Google S type companies to hire the best employees, which we got from like Netflix, Amazon, all those types right. of companies come in to work for us. But, you know, from a productivity point of view, even though it was a fun atmosphere and I'd even ride around on skateboards and all that kind of stuff, um, it was still amazingly productive because people wanted to work there. They were in a good mood, you know, they, they were happy employees. So they, they help, you know, create happy customers and, Uh, That worked phenomenal for us for a good amount of time. But then this little thing called the pandemic happened. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, we have have lots to talk about there. Okay, but let's actually, can we wind back further? So you took a Series A, but you seeded Whitetail yourself. You had had an exit prior to that. Yeah. Um, Have you ever, uh, or have you bootstrapped every business you've started or did you? Pretty much. You did. Okay. Yeah, I, Uh, I did. I didn't learn this until later in life, literally like within the last year or two that I'm a, what's called a quick start person, if you've ever heard of uh, the Colby method. Mm -hmm. And so I love um, solving a problem, um, getting my my hands dirty and getting things off the ground. Like I'm really good at, you know, startups basically. And there's fail fast with that. So there's a lot of risk. Um, and you need to know when to cut it off and it's not going to work and you need to get to that failure really fast to learn, you know, what is going to work. 
Um, so that's kind of what I like to do. And I really like to do that on a budget. Um, tons of sweat equity and make sure you're fair to people, but, you know, get the right people involved that, you know, see the vision and are willing to work really, really hard to see that success. And then I like to grow companies up to a certain point. Um, then I like to bring in outsiders. And that's kind of one of the other reasons to bring in the PE. You know, we were growing so fast. Um, I wanted some expertise that I haven't had access to before. So my investors who have been honestly great, which you don't always hear that, um, they were able to bring in a lot of resources for me. And, you know, we got to like gap financials and, you know, all the stuff that you've, right. you know, gone through as a, as a growing company. So um, it, was, it was a good partnership. Yeah, we're we're actually, and we could talk some more offline, but we're actually just now getting ready to start making some rounds on the PE circuit. Kind of the same deal. You know, we're, uh, I, 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 can you skip right to series B? I think we're probably too big to call it a series A and we don't need it, but it's kind of the same thing. It's just like, what does it look like to get access to a different level of brain trust and bring in some accelerant, you know, jet fuel? Yeah. I, I think it's like less about the money. Cause if you have a good business model, I mean, the, the financials should work in your favor and the investor's favor. Right. But like the resources and connections they have and the management they're able to provide, like the right kind of PE group, um, is going to be able to lend experience and do things that you really shouldn't be focused on, like, you know, running HR and like certain parts of the financial model. Like they should be able to lend that to that experience, prepping you for an exit, prepping you to go public, you know, whatever those things are, um, connections with, you know, the right legal people, you know, they, they've been there, they've seen that movie. Like, why would you want to reinvent that wheel? So yeah, definitely hooking up with the right group, but making sure that the deal is fair. Um, I have advised a lot of my customers, you know, I've helped some of my customers actually get financing, but I've also helped some of my customer avoid really bad deals. Cause sometimes people just focus on the money. And if it's just about that, you might be getting into a relationship that's going to surprise you. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard horror stories. I, I, in fact, my agency, I sold as you know, or you may know, I mean, what you know is that we were your customer and then all of a sudden we weren't anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You guys did good. That was, that was a good result. Yeah. I, I sold it. To and then you came back. But they had a they had an, a a VC partner that I don't think that relationship was what they thought, and it ended up trickling down through the acquisition deal in terms, and I ended up getting kind of screwed as a secondary byproduct of their VC relationship. I can remember that. I remember that because it's like it's like even if you're not dealing with a shark, you might be dealing with someone that's tethered to a shark. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But okay, but but actually, you know what? And and I want to I want to go down that trail with you, probably on a different conversation because like. I'm, I have a lot to learn, but I, I want to sort of keep the audience in mind and, and make sure that we don't not talk about your truly humble beginnings. Yes. Uh, how far back in your life are you willing to go to take us back to little Nick with a twinkle in his eye? Oh, well, that started probably in third grade when my dad gave me a trash 80, TRS 80, yeah. you know, a little computer. And then um, that graduated up to watching my dad put a handset on a coupled modem and mm -hmm. dialing into his bank. And I thought that was the coolest thing. So my dad go to bed, I'd sneak up there and get on his bank computer, which is probably not the right thing to do. And at least dial in, maybe I didn't log in and do too much, but you know, just to see another computer connected. You just, want, you just wanted to hear the. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That, that sound is amazing. Oh, yeah. And um, you know, just seeing networking and the communications and all those pre-internet that we know today, um, communications was super fascinating. So that got me really hooked. And um, I'll, I'll try to keep it pretty short because you know you guys want to hear the whole life story. But uh, that led me um, to high school, um, where my family moved to Idaho for a little bit, and so I followed my dad out there. Where I actually got kicked out of high school for hacking, believe it or not. Even though I didn't really do anything, I was just kind of looking around, you know, the operating system and stuff. And the teachers like. You're not supposed to be there. Kick me out of school. So you wait, was, so you hacked into the compute the the school. No, I, it, it sounds way cooler than it is. Literally, okay. just think about like dropping to a command prompt, looking around, and you know I already did the class assignment. You know this right. is like simple stuff, right? And so I was just poking around the computer, maybe pinging some you know printers on the network, and you know printing out something. I just, I mean, so if you told a hacker you were on a school computer. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, if you told a hacker what I was doing, it's like, there's like, that's not hacking. But anyways, they, they saw me poking around when I was, they wanted me to diligently work on a work product that I already completed, right? 
And so um, my dad actually kind of saved my butt on that one and uh, went back into school and said, hey, instead of like, you know, dealing with all this like suspension stuff, like, why don't you just hire my son? You guys clearly need some computer help, right? Mm -hmm. So actually ended up that uh, the school district actually hired me as an employee. So I was in high school, uh, sophomore year, sophomore summer going into junior year. I was actually an employee for the school district, setting up computers, their network, and I got really lucky. And at the same time, um, the school district got a grant from the state of Idaho for, I think it was around a million bucks. And so they were getting this influx of money and they needed help, you know, investing that money. So we got like fiber optics. We called up Cisco. We got them involved. We networked all the schools together. And this is, you know, kind of like Novell, you know, Microsoft Windows NT days. Uh, they had an email server that was terrible. So I set up a Linux, you know, SMTP server. I think it was Qmail back then. And got all that just to run super stable. And um, what happened from there is uh, Microsoft heard about me and actually gave me a scholarship. But the deal was is I had to get uh, to Microsoft and I was only a junior, but I had to be a high school graduate. So um, the teachers kind of rallied around me and everybody was super helpful at the high school. And so I did my junior year during the day, senior year at night, graduated as a junior, flew right back to Los Angeles, Torrance, got trained by Microsoft and went down that whole, you know, rabbit hole and went to work for Dell computers and long story there. But, um, that's kind of how I got my start in computers, I guess, and started getting paid. Okay. And then how did it switch into telephone system? Okay. So, um, I was not making a lot of money, even though I was in the computer land in the nineties, I think I was making somewhere around 32, $35,000 a year. I did not have a college degree. So when you work for a really big company, they have these things called salary bands and you have to have certain qualifications. And if you have a certain and right type of degrees and work experience and history reviews, blah, 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 you get to make more. So I'm, I'm kicking butt at this company doing everything I can to like climb this like corporate ladder, but I'm at the bottom. I'm like it guy at like huge, big, you know, consulting. Company. What's that? Are cool. you the, like that Jimmy Fallon Saturday night live skit? What's, uh, the it guy who, I don't know. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. It was, was fun. It that, was it that low on the totem pole or something? It was pretty low. It was pretty low. I think I was sitting in a basement <laughs> literally, you know, so it was pretty low. Asking, asking where your stapler was. Yep. Yep. But I was working with some very high end people that were working for amazing companies like FedEx and all this kind of stuff. So I was surrounded by smart people, but definitely the it guy. Um, so my uncle calls me up. And he's like, hey, um, we have a couple T1 lines going into a Toshiba DK424. And um, we're doing really well. Um, he, he was in the banking business down in Orange County. And I need your help. Will you come work for me? And I was like, sure. How much do you pay? And he's like, I'll give you six figures if you can come like in the next two weeks. And I was like, I'm making $34,000 a year living in Los Angeles where it's super expensive, right? And so basically I went to my boss and I was like, I got to take this, man. This is, this is multitudes of what, you know, you're paying. And so, you know, we worked out a nice deal and I left on good terms, came down to Orange County, was making six figures. And, uh, that was an amazing experience. So that got me into phones, fixed the phone system. Uh, this was like in 98, 99. And I actually connected the phone system to a quasi, you know, pre CRM like system to track customers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that, you know, uh, employees could see it when someone calls in, all their information would pop up on the screen, stuff that we're used to today, right. but got a really early start in that and was just kind of known as like the guy who could connect phone systems to computers. Okay. So I want to kind of pause the story right there because somebody listening could go, oh, well, I get it. Nick is successful because he was in the right place at the right time. Right. And if he and got, had a few little quirky things, got get lucky. Well, instead of getting kicked out of school, he got hired by the school. Right. You know, good for him, right? And I obviously know you well enough, and I, I know enough successful people to know that it's, you know, you you create your own luck to some degree by you know when preparation meets opportunity, but there's still so much more to it than that. And so I, I'm thinking back to uh, that same time, mid to late '90s. That was when I dropped out of high school. I dropped out of high school in 1990, I think spring of '96. But I got kicked out of my previous high school in the spring of 95. So right around then, I was sort of, let's say, at a comparable place of like, what am I going to do with my life? And one of the first things I ended up in was I took this money that my parents had set aside to help me go to college. And I said, hey, guy, because I dropped out of high school, I was like, well, clearly that 
money's, you know, not going to go where it was intended. So can I have it? Because I have this, I want to start this thing. And I ended up hiring the IT guy at my dad's office who was doing like all the Microsoft networking. And supposedly he was a programmer or coder. I don't remember what word he used. Uh, but back then it was just like, oh, you do, comp you know, now there's like, 900 different super specialized roles across right. IT, right? You have like your UI guy and your UX guy and your front end guy and your server side guy and you're this guy and you're that guy. Back then it was just like, oh, I'm a computer scientist. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Yoda. And I was like, oh, I want to create, I had this idea for this online thing and I paid all my college money to him and he never produced a line of code and it was a big waste. Oh, Dude. but anyway, the reason I say that is I have in my mind, I can picture him now a deadbeat office IT networking computer scientist guy. And then I can picture him and I can picture Nick Newsom. And I have no idea where this person ended up in his life, but I'm confident it's not where you ended up in your life. Right. And so my point is that guy was in the right place at the right time too. He was in computers and networking in the late 90s. Yeah, that was hot. But it, like there's still a lot, it's it's still there's still intangibles. There's still how you approach your craft, there's still a lot of, I, I won't even presume to say what they are because I want you to tell me what they are. What What do you think you were doing? What do you think you were bringing to the game every day that that a savvy person could have looked at and said, okay, I see potential here because he's doing this, this, and this that's going to predict where he's going to be in 25 years. Okay, so the first thing that comes to mind is passion. Like, you got to be passionate, especially when you're young, passionate about what you're doing. And if you're not, passionate about it, you should probably like switch jobs. If your parents are telling you to be a doctor and you don't want to be a doctor, you know, you might not make it through med school. Right. So right. I, I really think you need to do something you love. You never work another day in your life. Right. Um, so I just happened to be passionate about computers so much so that when I was given a challenge, even if it was hard and I wanted to go cry, I would not give up no matter what. So like some of the things we worked on in IT, like you could throw your hands up in the air, you know, IT people love to point fingers. You could be like, oh, it's the vendor and, you know, you know, throw it off. It's like, listen, if I was given something, I would not give up. I mean, it was not uncommon to find passionate people in these bigger companies and in small companies staying up until 5 a.m., literally two or three hours before the first employee walks through the door and having the entire system ready to go because you did not want to let people down. You know what I mean? Um, so I think that was kind of the biggest thing I, I clued into. And I think just through experience of being passionate about my craft, um, you know, earned me an, a lot of knowledge and then just, you know, never giving up. So I, I think that's, that's key. Okay. Let's double click on what you just said. Your passion earned you a lot of knowledge. That's yeah. actually a pretty dense statement. Describe to me the mechanisms through which passion resulted in more incremental gain of knowledge than an otherwise less passionate existence. Yeah. So I have uh, my financial advisor, for example, we went snowboarding uh, 10 years ago. And uh, this is when he was more working for another company. Now he owns his own firm and you know manages a ton of money. Um, but like while we were on our snowboarding trip, he's literally reading you know, uh, reports from public companies and, and reading all their statements. And he just was passionate about learning about public companies and their financial performance. Something that I wouldn't think is the coolest thing to do on a snowboarding trip, but he was so passionate about it that he just liked to do that. So I think if you purposely choose something that you're passionate about, you want to absorb more information and it's actually fun to you. And you, you want to research it. You want to be the best. You want to learn more. You understand that you're not the expert, but you want to become the expert. So you do that hard work and that research to do that, right? It's much easier to do that than like studying for a test about a subject that you don't really like, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's one way to earn knowledge. Um, I think another way to do it is people will respect that you're passionate about something, especially if you're humble and you say, listen, I don't know how to cook this meal, but would you teach me, right? And you're a good student and you listen and you don't try to tell them the expert what to do, but they're, but they're, you're a willing participant in being a student. Um, you know, you earn yourself into the right, um, circumstances to bump into the right people to get yeah. knowledge and experience, which you can't really like read about experience or how to translate. But when you talk to someone like yourself or 
someone that's been doing something 20 more years than you've been doing it, they're going to give you some shortcuts. Yeah, I, I, that you, you went right where I was hoping you'd go, which is just the way it feels to be around a really passionate, driven person. It, it can be, it, frankly, it, it actually is a good, a, a good way to grade other people. You can learn a lot about other people by how they act in proximity to a passionate, driven person. Yeah. Because, and leadership is the same way, kind of like Maxwell's law of the lid, where leader, you, you can't lead someone who's a better leader than you. It just, it just won't work. They won't, it will not, it's not that they will resist it. It just simply won't function. And I think in the same way, passionate people inspire and animate passionate people and they alienate and repel dispassionate people. And so a passionate person, you'll see the other, the more, the passionate people around them will resonate with their passion and they'll be like, oh, I'm working on this thing. And I, and even if you don't know, I see that you've got the spirit to learn the thing. So maybe help me with the thing. And then the thing plus the thing is one plus one equals 11. And then now you're known, you just become known as this person that, that creates value multiplication with whatever you touch because of how you show up to it, not what you bring to it. And then the opportunities start to compound. And I'm saying all this, it makes me think of this, this Mark Cuban quote I heard one time about like, what advice would you give to people that are just starting out? And he's like, the great equalizer is enthusiasm. For sure. Like you don't have, there's no college degree requirement. There's no net worth requirement. There's no what school you went to requirement. It's just like, be a really enthusiastic person. And that they're like nine, in 9 million ways, you can never predict the law of compounding will produce opportunity for you. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, I think a, another shortcut to be enthusiastic and passionate is um, learning what kind of person you are. And there's a ton of personal net, personality tests you can go and research, you know, p- pick your poison. But like, there's going to be certain people listening to this that are like fact finders, like people that are like insanely good at picking apart information and digesting large volumes of information all over the internet to, you know, you know, make better ideas and uh, research how to be the best in their field. But those guys might not be follow through people or people that can, you know, take someone else's ideas and actually follow through and execute on them. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, again, I'm a quick start person. I like to jump in the fire and figure out how to put it out and make sure it doesn't happen again. But to do that, I might need a uh, fact finder to tell me, you know, how hot's the fire and, uh, give me some, uh, suggested ways to put out fires. And then, uh, I might surround myself with a couple implementers and, uh, follow through execution people to help me put the fire out. Right. right. But I'm leading people into that fire and doing all that stuff and not being afraid of the, the challenge or the risk involved. Um, so, you know, I think to be enthusiastic, sometimes people are just hard workers and they will actually be operating in a mode that is not really who they are. And sometimes it takes people decades to figure out what they're really good at. So I really encourage, you know, people and, you know, sometimes like speak at colleges and stuff. I really try to understand when I'm talking to a student who may be struggling to, you know, complete school or not. It's like, listen, what are you, what are you really good at? What do you really want to do? And they might not know the industry yet, but you know, if they're a great writer, it's like, okay, well, you got to find a position that is going to really let you be the best writer you can be. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. I do. And so on that note, uh, tell me when and why you made the pivot into full-fledged entrepreneurship and actually struck out from, I guess, maybe it was your uncle's company and, and really truly planted your own stakes. Um, I think it started... In like grade school, my dad had a book called Swimming with Sharks um, laying around and I just thought it was a cool story, (laughs) you know, these guys and, you know, you always see all the movies on like Wall Street and all these guys just kind of like fighting that corporate ladder and, you know, being their own boss and all that kind of stuff. So I think um, that always fascinated me to, to be a leader and to really be on a team. Um, So I think I just kind of had that in my DNA. I, I don't, you know, I didn't have like wealthy parents to like see the business, you know, and I, I tried several businesses when I was young, but you know, most of them failed. I had some consulting businesses that, you know, when I got paid an hourly rate, you know, those worked and I was my own boss. So I got a little taste of it. Not they were, they were like, you know, companies with lots of employees or anything like that. Um, but the coolest thing, um, that happened and you could call it luck or you could call it taking a risk and having some, um, uh, I don't know if it's experience, but a re- reputation to do this. I went into my uncle's office and I said, look, um, you're paying me very good money. 
Um, I've built a really good team here. I'd like to go start my own business and I'd like you to become my first customer, right? Mm -hmm. And so instead of providing them a, a lose option of losing their CTO at the time, I provided them a win-win. They still have access to me. They don't have to pay for me. I'm leaving behind my team. I'm leaving behind no mess in the IT systems. You know, everything's running very smooth and I'm still going to be there along the way to help them grow. But at the same time, I'm going to be continuing to hone my craft and start my own company. So that's kind of how I got my entrepreneurship start in my first uh, real company where we developed a patent portfolio on um, some telephone, you know, patents and um, that kind of got me my start. When was that? 2004. Okay. So you're, what is it? 23 right now? That's actually. Yep. Yep. State of my ago. life as I'm uncertain of the year, but uh, yeah, right. so you're, you're coming up on 20 years as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was, I mean, technically I was starting businesses when I was 15. I mean, I actually had a, um, I actually had the state of Idaho paying me a, a consulting fee to run their network and do tech support and that kind of stuff. So it was kind of crazy because they were paying me $65 an hour. I was a junior in high school. That was my second gig. My first gig was working as a, a for the school district. And I was getting paid $3 and like 25 cents an hour, which was Idaho minimum state wage at the time. So imagine $6, $65 an hour, and teachers were probably making somewhere in between there. So my teachers very well knew that I was making more money than they were being in high school, which was kind of cool. Yeah, that's that's so funny. By the way, great, you know, people are like, oh, Jeff, life's much easier if, if I just keep my job. Like, what's with all this entrepreneurship stuff? Where else can you go from making $3 an hour to making $65 an hour in like 30 days? Yeah. That's why you become an entrepreneur because- yep. It may be harder. It may be thankless. You may toil fruitlessly for years, but yep. damn it, when something finally clicks, that 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 two percent raise that your neighbor got at his job at the end of last year is laughable because your income just ten x. Yes, and you're building equity in a business that has you know a valuation multiple at either net profit or top line revenue numbers, which can get really big. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so. Uh, you started your own consulting business well, almost 20 years ago. Um, take me through the journey. And in particular, because I'm again, I'm always thinking to the audience, you know, what is it that I'm wanting the audience to glean from these conversations that maybe not every other podcast is talking about, even every other business or entrepreneurship yeah. podcast. And, and what I always find is that the the less talked about reality of business centers around is people, people leadership, people management, people optimization, people investment, people care, people love. So talk to me about your growth as a people leader. Maybe that's one lens at least to look at it through over the last 20 years. Yeah. You know, and when you're saying that, um, I think the, the humbling part and learning from failure has been the biggest way for me to grow internally, like seeing projects not work, um, having to do, you know, layoffs during hard times, um, things like that will really build your character and how you execute those things, um, even more so and how people remember you and, uh, those that you continue to work with, how they respect you. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that's, that's one piece is, you know, kind of remaining humble, um, and digressing just a bit, but, I've also come across quite a few people that want to be, you know, their own boss and, you know, be entrepreneurship, but, um, they really don't have it. And what I mean by that is they want the luxury of making a lot of money and building equity in a business and being their own boss, but they're not technically willing to make the sacrifice. I'm not saying this is right. And I think a lot of, you know, CEOs like us could have better work-life balance with their families, but when you're starting a business, you kind of need to put everything else on pause. It's so cutthroat. It's so difficult to do that. You got to go in a hundred percent, in my opinion, to get a business off the ground. And I, I think a lot of people like the, the glam and glory of the win, but they don't quite realize the effort needed to get a business off the ground successfully. So I think you, you just touched on, I'll just say, a significant chunk, let's say maybe 50% ish of what I, what I think is like the core foundation of business success, right? Entrepreneurial success. I totally agree with you. It's essentially, 
a work ethic or and or a work process that produces work ethic like effect. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean. That is, let's just say elite relative to the norm or the expected of what else is out there for most, you know, what most what you expect from most people, what you expect from a successful entrepreneur is probably 10 times what you expect from quote most people and not you just have to be willing to I agree do that the other half like I alluded to is around particularly as you grow as you scale a business not maybe not you know when it's small but if you're going to build an enterprise people skills soft skills communication and a really really you know deep strategic minds not just around business strategy and like quantitative, but around human strategy. Like how, like you talked about layoffs, right? Like to be able to navigate a situation like that and have enough empathy and, and, and circumspection around how people operate in different types of emotional situations that you can come out of the other side of that, having all gone through a hard thing together instead of having your team associate you with that hard thing. Right. Right. And that's that's a much softer, more more maybe nuanced aspect. So, I kind of want to talk about both, but let's let's stick with the hard work aspect. Um, what I what we teach, at, I'll I'll say in my my world at Entra, because we, we're in this unique situation where what you just said is obviously true. Like, if you want to take an entrepreneurial turn for your life, you're probably going to have to double what you expect of yourself on a daily basis in terms of just how easy you work, right? right? Mm -hmm. But also, we're not saying burn your boats, leave your wife, ditch your kids, quit your job, you know. So so the way we approach it, and I'm curious for you to, you know, maybe talk about any such work you've done in your own life is how do you optimize your life? Just like if you inherited a struggling business, you would go, hey, we're going to turn this thing around. We're going to optimize it. We're going to make it more efficient. We're going to streamline it. We're going to you know, speed up the deliverables. We're going to squeeze more dollars. We're going to eliminate friction points in the process. But to actually do that to your life so that you can create, because I believe, and I'm curious if you agree with this, there is actually a way to have your cake and eat it too. You can struct, you can create a life that is so structured and so optimized that you can operate at a professional level far beyond what most people are able to output and still yeah. have time for the, the other, you know, call it the, the spice of life type stuff, family and so forth. I, I will say, unfortunately, um, I did not have access to Entree or something like it um, to have a blueprint to do that. So I had to go about it the somewhat wrong way. It was right in that I got my business off the ground and I was successful and all that, but at extreme cost of time with uh, my family, my kids. And I've been able to recover nicely and I've had to do my own hard work and researching work-life balance, which I've implemented throughout my company. And I believe that our culture has good work-life balance, but um, having access to materials like you provide, I think is critical in shortcuts people because I see a ton of people that just start up and then they frankly burn out yeah. um, or they you know, lead their family and they're a bad leader and they get a divorce, which is not a success anyways. Who cares if you have a business if your family's falling apart. You really need to maintain both. So that work-life balance is super important. Having alignment with your family, having your family actually support you, um, having that blueprint, man, that would be, that's like priceless. So so talk to me a little bit about, I, I know like, for example, last time we caught up, you were telling me about some of your plans, um, whether it was with your your teenage son. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, whether, whether we get into that or not, like, talk to me a little bit about your development as a balancer of work and life to not just hang on to both, but to actually do both at a, at a really high level. Yeah. So something, you know, I'm very scheduled. So if you look at my calendar, you know, just like coming on this podcast today, I mean, everything is super scheduled, right? So now I take deliberate time and schedule out time with my family, whether that's vacations, my son's a uh, motocross rider. He's a couple of years from, you know, most likely going pro. Um, so scheduling that out, making uh, time to do that. But then also like, you know, I'm good at, you know, marketing and sales and those types of things. So like I built my son a website. Well, guess what? I always thought it'd be cool. Like, hey, my son can be my little tech nerd friend with me. That's not going to happen. He's like a mechanic. He's very hands-on. He's very athletic. So it's like, son, you go do what you're good at. I'm going to support you and I'm going to do what I'm good at. So I built him a website. Lo and behold, he has sponsors from that website, which is great. I refer him some Ytel customers. They sponsor my son. It's a big, happy family. 
And um, yeah, I mean, that that has created an environment where I'm still working, but I'm not just doing my my daytime full-time job. I'm also working on my son's brand and his business, and I'm allowing my son to see and borrow pieces of what I'm good at and learn from me, but I'm not forcing my son to be me. He's being himself and he's growing as his own individual and I'm supporting that. And he's taking pieces from the people I surround him with. Like um, he worked on a a professional NHRA uh, drag team uh, about a year ago. Mm. Um, You know, he was actually in the pits working on the car with the guys and that kind of stuff. Uh, We used to sponsor a race team. And so like putting around those, those people and he's taken some of those experiences and brought that back into his own little, you know, race world at what he does at this level. So, um, I think a lot of, a lot of parents try to kind of force their kids to, to be themselves. And it's like, no, it's just figure out what they want to do and support that. So you mentioned something that I actually, you know, I think, I believe, and we teach at Entra is, is really one of the starting points of, of a new level of success, kind of like an order of magnitude change. Like, like, like I'm not a big fan of trying to be like incrementally better than I was like, oh, well. You know, like the I, every year people get a 2.8. Yeah. You like to time rate. travel? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 2.8% raise in an era of 8% inflation. Oh, yeah. Terrible. Oh, yeah. You only lost 5% more. Right. Rate. That's terrible. So, <laughs> so it's like, how do I double my performance year over year? Right. And um, step number one for me is scheduling. Like you nailed it. I've interviewed, this is, I think this is roughly episode number 260. And I just, I interview the most successful people I can find to talk to and look for commonalities. And that's literally the point of this show. It's a big research project on like, what is res- what does success look like across a wide enough sample group that nobody can debate it anymore? And that's, that's probably one of the top three takeaways is these people are scheduled. And you talked about having it written down. I, I literally behind the screen that I'm looking at right now, I have my schedule. It's color coded. Yep. It looks like a Tetris board. Right. And that's my life. That's every day of my life is like that. And I want to, I want to share something with you that you may or may not know, but for the audience's benefit, if you actually look up the root of the word schedule, what is the etymology of the word schedule? In fact, I'll fun pop quiz. Do you have any idea? I have no idea. I have, I'm Googling it as we speak. It, it actually comes from the Latin word sedula. Would you like to tell us what that means? Sedula. Uh, let's see. Old French cedula from late Latin, slip of paper. Slip of paper. People think they have a schedule because they know what they're doing that day. Bullshit. If it ain't written down, it's in the word on a slip of paper or I'll accept digital paper now. It's not a schedule. Yeah, you live life with intention. You could show to other yep. people because then they have to bend around it too. Yeah. And that is one of the biggest things that I try to install into people's lives is like, Okay, how many words worth of excuses do you need to dribble out before we can just be done with that and get to the part where you actually just keep a schedule? Yeah. You know, it's kind of crazy is, uh, so I learned how to schedule, I would say 2015, 16. So I've been doing it for seven years, hardcore. Before I had a calendar, reminders. And back in the 90s, I actually used what's called the Franklin Planner, which is dating myself. But for anybody old, you know what that means. Um, but I, I took one personality test and it had like some pros and cons of my personality. And it, one thing really struck me. It said, don't over schedule. I'm like, what does that mean? Cause I mean, I'm pretty damn scheduled. And sometimes I'm a little burnt out at the end of the day, which probably isn't good for my family. Right. So, um, one thing I do now is I schedule Mondays to be reactive. So I actually put a block of time in so people don't over schedule me so that, you know, if a customer needs something, I can react to them on a Monday. We have a lot of customers that call us on Mondays, right? On Wednesday afternoons, I schedule a block in the afternoon called recovery. So I do self-care on that day. I go to the gym. I make sure to eat healthy. I can go to uh, my favorite grocery store and stock my little fridge with good food. And then on Friday, um, I actually have like time blocked off and it's kind of like optional. Like I can choose to work or not. And guess what? I had to learn how to not be guilty about purposely taking that time off because I'm working all the time. Like you can call me on Saturday, Sunday, whatever. Like I'm always there for my customers, my friends, my family. Right. Um, so I had to kind of like get used to having these like three medium sized blocks blocking out all the busy work. And, and I would love more of your advice on this. Tell me what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. The other thing that has been hitting me like recently 
it's because my schedule is completely full, like literally two or three weeks out, like just jam packed. Um, I've been learning how to, well, I think I still need your advice on a better way to say no, but low value meetings are on my schedule and wiping those out without feeling too bad and maybe redirecting people to the appropriate resource um, is something I'm looking for advice on. Well, I, you know, I'm in, I think, the fortunate position where literally part of my job description as a, you know, in, in my world with the various roles I play in my life is thinking about how to be a more efficient, more effective, more productive, and more fulfilled, ultimately, human being all the time because I produce content on that. I teach that. I mentor that. I, I sanction curriculum around that. And I obviously try to be my own laboratory in which to do that. And so that's one of the the happy you know accidents of my life is that I get to constantly be working on how to help other people get better. But so that I'm not a hypocrite, I feel like I have to be getting better too. Um, yeah. So what what I would say is is my approach, you know, short of if somebody like I mean somebody wants to hire me to go do one on one coaching, I can do it. But what I always try, even if I do, I always try to get more into first principles than let's say like case by case application of those principles. So like, so if, even in your case or for the audience who wants to map this to themselves, the two things that I heard in what you said that are where I would start are the first principles around leverage, which like when you're talking about low value meetings, right? So we have this, um, you know, delete, delegate, optimize framework uh, that we talk about. Like, is it something you can get out of? Is it something you can create, you can delegate to someone else? Is it something you can optimize or systematize or create a process so that it at least reduces the amount of, of energy that you have to put in? Um, so, so always just trying to be increasing the average unit of the average leverage per unit of time in your life, like obsessively. Like that's one of my obsessions, right? And some people think it's like increasing the monetary value of my time. But to me, if you're always measuring things by money, you're, you're looking for the lagging indicator to lead. But if you're measuring things by, am I working, am I building towards more leverage? Then you can be pretty assured that eventually you'll be working towards more money per unit of input, whatever time or so forth. The other principle that I heard a lot in what you were talking about is, uh, is like proactive versus reactive. And I think that a lot of people in how they do their schedule, they go, oh, well, I'm already very scheduled. But you can hear it in the language. It's passive. It happens to your schedule. They made it sound like their schedule happens to them. Right. Right. No, I'm I'm already very uh, scheduled. No, I already very aggressively schedule myself. It's a right. completely different energy. Totally. Um, and then and then the. Uh, that's why. By, by the way, that's why I don't like booking pages. Sometimes when like a salesperson sends oh, me a yeah. booking page, I'm just like, yeah, you don't really care. Like have a dialogue with me before you send me your calendly link. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And then, and then the third, Ooh, I'm, I'm actually blanking out when you were talking, I was thinking of three first principles. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. No, it's fine. It's fine. Let's keep talking. And it, it'll, no. it'll come back to me. No, it was the pro proactive versus reactive. Yeah. So that was the second one is like, and I actually like that you schedule in re time to be reactive. Be oh, and I know, I remember the third first principle now because it defuses the tendency of other times to become reactive or to get hijacked by reactivity because you have a place to deflect that too. So that's the leverage then. So you're you're it you're is. leveraging. Yeah, it's it's a form of leverage. Yeah. It's a form of leveraging in that you're reducing the probability that non-reactive time is going to force be forcibly made into reactive time because you right. in a container for it. And this is the I'd say this is the most central first principle of scheduling is to really become a scientist around decisions. So to me, the first goal of scheduling is just a raw reduction in the number of decisions that need to be made in the moment that they're relevant. To me, scheduling your life is deciding in advance so that you don't have to decide in the moment what you're going to be doing, how you want the apportionment of your life, you know, sort of the meta, the meta allocation of time. How do you want it to look, right? If you say, man, I really think the optimal version of me spends 10 hours a week on my health and fitness. Well, if you're waiting for 10 individual hours to happen throughout the week when it's convenient and you feel like deciding to use one on your health and fitness, guess what? 
you're probably going to get to the end of the week and have done nothing for your health and fitness. But if you scheduled ahead of time 10 hours of health and fitness, that's one decision instead of 10. You don't have to make anymore. And so part of it is reducing quantity of decisions. And then I think even if there's, even if you say, well, it's ridiculous, nobody can decide everything ahead of time, you can still make more fundamental decisions that like to your point, allow allow for for let's call it a second order or a third order decision, but the first order decision was still already made. Like when you block off reactive time, obviously within that reactive time, you're probably going to be making lots of decisions about what to react to and how to react. But the more significant decision of having the time be dedicated to reactivity was already made. Right. Yeah, that's really well said. I love the idea of not scheduling time and then doing double the work, trying to figure out like you should do the work in advance of a meeting to figure out what you want the output to be. Cause if you don't do that, you're leaving it up to chance. And you it probably have a, a really good, do you have an assistant that runs your schedule? I don't. So I used to, I used to actually have a medical doctor running my schedule and um, she went back to teach again. Cause that was her true passion. And I'm mm-hmm. totally cool with that. Um, I actually kind of like running it myself. So this, so yeah, and I'm I'm agnostic about whether a person. Runs I mean, people people can put time on my calendar, but I I really need to understand. I mean, it's my Bible. It's literally I wake up in the morning and that's what I follow. Before I go to bed, I look at the next day and make sure everything's lined up. It actually kind of de-stresses me because yeah. I can go to sleep and just you know let my brain do its thing. Um, but if I know what's up and it's organized, man, I'm 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 cool, calm, and collected. So. I love that you review it the night before. We we call that taking our taking our nap, our nightly assessment and planning session. Mm. We're not allowed to go to sleep until we've had our nap. Yeah, that makes and, sense. Uh, and 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 I agree with you because then you just wake up the next morning and literally the second your feet touch the ground, you're already into the flow. Yep. You're not stopping to go wait. Yep. Is it, that's like it's like at the tip off of a basketball beat. Yeah, game. that sucks. Oh, hold on, wait. Which yeah. which basket am I trying to score on? And like by then you're already down two points, right? In, in flying airplanes, we call it behind the power curve. If you're behind the power curve, you're probably going to crash. You're, yeah, you're probably dead. Okay, so um, so I love that. The reason I asked if you have an assistant isn't because, and, and I realize a lot of people don't have the luxury. It's not like, oh, well, you'll really, get, you'll really nail this once you have an assistant. But I will say, you'll really nail this once you have your, your scheduling methodology so precisely defined that you could give it to an assistant to run as an SOP, whether you oh, yeah. or not. I, so I actually did that in my my sales department. I have a specific person that schedules um, meetings for me, and they know exactly how to use my calendar, and it has been a godsend. So do they know, like, do you have rules of like, okay, this time to this time on these days is for this type of thing? I know you said you, you yeah. block off certain things. Yeah. Like, how, de- how detailed is your SOP for how you run your own schedule? Oh, I mean, I think it could be better. I think you you probably have a blueprint, but I would say it's it's fairly detailed and it's descriptive so that other people can see it. I also have my my calendar public to all my employees. So like literally everybody can go on there very transparent. They can be like, yeah, Nick's a little busy that day. Probably should push it to the next day. Um, you know, we can pair up meetings together on topics that are, you know, congruent with each other. Um, so- Maybe not written you, standard operating procedure, but yeah, I'm open to ideas. Over, and admittedly, some of it may not need to be written down because you do it yourself. But if you were going to enlist somebody, like, could you actually just document your scheduling process and hand it to someone? And without a lot of explanation, it would just be right. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right? So, yeah. And, I would, and I would gain back at least an hour a day. That's five hours a week. Yeah. I mean, all right. I recently read uh, "Buy Back Your Time" by Dan Martell. Who? By the, do you know Dan? I don't. Okay, I've so heard of he him. He runs. He runs SAS Academy. He was a great dude. I should probably introduce you guys. Probably he probably has a hundred clients that need Whitetail. So Perfect. I'll, I'll have to connect you guys. But but anyway, I, I recently I read that. It's probably been six months, and that that was right when I was bringing on a new EA, and that took it to a whole other level of updating the SOPs and so forth. But but ultimately. This is what I have found. I, I like that you said it's your Bible, is that that schedule as really the hub of all the different spokes that connect into your life, where it all has to flow through. So I'm curious, have you integrated your personal life and even your family into that same scheduling app? I have. Yeah. Yeah. So I make sure, so I I, I use Google Calendar. Yeah. 
Um, my family's on iPhones. I purposely install the Google Calendar app so they have native access to my calendar. They can see what I'm doing. And I purposely schedule family time, vacations, block. That way my work life and my personal life can interoperate with each other so my employees know that I'm going to be traveling or whatever it is. And uh, my family knows that, you know, Saturday night we're doing a work event and they know that they can come with me or they kind of know what's up. And it just avoids so much confusion. I, I assume you have, and I use Google Calendar too. And like, yeah. I love that we're in the weeds of, of being nerdy entrepreneurs, but also this is just life. Yeah. Yeah, right. totally. Oh. Yep. Do you, do you have um, like your personal calendar? Like I'll, I'll just say for myself, I also have a shared calendar with Jacqueline, my wife, so that if there's something that's important to her and she sees I have availability, she can put it on there. But let's say it's like, you know, therapy appointment to work on Jeff's really annoying habit or something. I don't necessarily want that to show up on my work calendar. Yeah. So anything I want private, I throw my wife's calendar. Yeah. So you just have so kind of, I kind of use that as our shared calendar. Yeah, and you can set it so that it just appears. Yeah. As, what, are you? Yeah. Or are you busy? So so powerful. Or you, know, work, or you know, work. you know what else is kind of a life hack. So like I again, I still think if you're in sales and you're sending customers Calendly links to schedule with you, especially if you're the one who wants the meeting, that's like a super bad way to do it. You want to like get their time and and slot within when they're willing to commit to you. Uh, but. Using Calendly, Google Calendar has a built-in um, scheduling feature right in the right in the calendar there, but you can actually give that to your coworkers to schedule with you. Because what can happen is coworkers can accidentally over schedule over schedule you in a day. You don't want like a thirty minute, a thirty minute, a thirty minute. I mean, you need to go to the bathroom, right? You need to take mental breaks once in a while. So what you can do is use these scheduling apps to say, hey, uh, within these time frames, only book so many meetings per hour. Create a thirty minute buffer. And maybe not give them as much to customers, but give them to your coworkers, even your family. I mean, that's a little weird, but you know they can schedule that in, and then your calendar shouldn't be chock full back to back because you can only work so many hours in a day. You got to be purposeful about what you choose to spend your time on, and so that that system can kind of help create some space in your calendar. So you just you just said something pretty interesting uh, um, that that I think has a lot of charge behind it for good or for bad depending on who, who it is, right? You said, oh, you give, give the links to your family and oh, that's kind of weird, but, but it's only weird based on what's considered normal in your family. Right. So I'm curious, yeah. for somebody like you that's, let's say, a highly optimized, high-performance, entrepreneurial family, per family man, mm -hmm. how have you enrolled, and, and in particular, beef, well, I'll just say this to put it crassly, before you were rich, and your family was getting all the perks right. to be rich. How did you enroll them in living in the way that would ultimately allow you to experience the prosperity? Because you got to enroll them first. A lot of people think like, oh, my wife will be on board with this once I'm loaded. Well, trust me, until you get your wife on board with this, you can't show up as the best self that's going to have all that success. I, I think uh, if you're truly committed to your art, um, you're you're going to have those leadership skills and hopefully your your family for the most part is supporting you and hopefully you're taking some breaks but to be honest with you I was so heads down doing what I needed to do frankly not operating at the highest um you know the highest levels because I didn't have a blueprint I had to kind of fail to learn a lot of these things but I was just so heads down man I just probably messed it up and I was just I was just meet 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 and just got it done. You know, I just so, didn't okay. give up. I'd, I'd stay up until 3 a.m., but guess what? I wasn't leveraging my time. So I was actually being okay. inefficient. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to interject with giving you maybe a little bit more credit than you're giving yourself. The bottom line is your wife hung in there with you. Oh, for sure. You didn't go, screw this. I'm I'm, I'm going to go move in with my parents until he gets well, his yeah, but She but obviously believed that you were working towards something that would be a desirable future state. I, I was not I did not have a, a video game controller in my hand, chilling on the couch, talking to my internet right. friends. I was very- One of the ways you would- Unless, unless that's your job, of course. Right, right. But but it's so to, to state the obvious, it's embedded in what you just said. One of the ways you enroll your partner is you let them see how doggedly hard you're willing to work to give them, as well as yourself, a better life. Yeah. And you have to have output from it. I mean, the simple fact is you got to have output short-term, 
and long term. You gotta you gotta be the leader and you gotta cover the expenses and you gotta provide a basic quality of life with a with a direction of the future and you gotta make good on those commitments, you know? And if you fail, fail, you need to own it fast and you need to make course corrections and you need to surround yourself with smart people and uh, you need to make better decisions moving forward. And it's not easy. Just have to do it. It's hard. It's hard. It's, it's hard. hard. Yeah. yeah. I think that's... Uh, if if it was easy, everybody would do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's I think, the, the embedded harsh truth certainly in everything that I stand for is that like the starting point of the life you want is probably outworking most people. Yeah. And I think, you know, sometimes people kind of confuse material, material items with being happy, but I mean, let's put it this way. If you could find what you're passionate about, uh, enroll yourself in a program like you guys offer and have some blueprints and kind of time hack your way to things. And let's just say you're affording um, an income where you have, you know, good shelter and you can have a little bit of fun once in a while with your spouse and, you know, have kids and all that kind of stuff and work towards a better future. Don't forget to live in that moment, you know, because if you're always just looking at the future and the next day, you're, you're kind of forgetting to really enjoy the day that you're having right ahead of you. And so I think you also have to maybe not slow down, but you need to appreciate the hard work. Like my, my dad's a pilot, right? When I was eight years old or nine years old, if I finished my homework, my dad would take me flying. Well, we get to the airplane and I'd want to jump in and grab the yoke and be like, let's go, you know? But the reality is my dad was always like, listen, slow down. It's all about checking out the airplane. Let's make sure it's safe. Let's check the fuel. Is there any water in it? And you, you really got to learn to slow down and, and kind of love uh, what you're doing. And I think that'll help with your, your family and your friends greatly as you go on this, on this journey to do whatever you want to do in life. Yeah. Well, you, you earlier, you talked about having passion and I think that very much having passion aligns with, and, and I think you alluded to this, it aligns with sort of doing what you're designed to do. Like different people have different, you know, uh, in, the the evolutionary theory would be intelligent design. Like you were designed to do an, a, a specific thing. Yeah, uh, we might call it a calling. We might call it a purpose. One you, one one of the the days my life changed is when I I actually decided to look up what the word fulfillment really means. Where does it come from? You've, you've already detected. I like to know yeah. the of words, and it actually comes from the old English word fulfill on, which was the word for prophecy, meaning the fulfillment of a prophecy. We all want to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. We don't realize that to be fulfilled, we have to fulfill what we were designed and destined to do. Yeah. If not, we can't. We can't be fulfilled. So uh, I think part of, I say all that to say that, yeah, like the the zone of operation in which you are working hard enough that you can produce the outlier result. And to your point that it's not just a material success that you're looking for, but it's a complete uh, life satisfaction index is what they call it in, in psychology. It's called Cantrell's Ladder, like on the on the relative scale of how happy you could possibly be if resources weren't a question, how happy actually are you? Like to get as close to that as possible and and to enroll the people around you and to be the kind of person that people actually enjoy being around so that even when you come home after 14 hours of a hard day, your wife is like actually happy to be around you because you just feel good to be around and you have good resonant energy and like all that stuff. It all starts with just doing what you're supposed to do. So I'm curious... Do you feel, and, and, and I get the sense, I know the answer, Are do you feel like you found your groove? You found what Nick was was called to do in this world? And I guess secondary question is like, how do you advise or help other steer other people through the mentorship that you do to figure out what their thing actually is that they could be fulfilled by? Yeah, so absolutely, yes. I feel like I've, I've uh, been able to do what I'm good at doing, but I will say in my forties, it's amazing to learn even more about what I'm actually designed to do. Mm. And I think that a lot of people, especially in a CEO position or any kind of leadership position, managerial, even just day to day, whatever you're doing, you can force yourself to be good at things. Mm. You can swing the bat enough times to, you know, hopefully hit the ball, right? You can practice at being good doesn't mean that's what you're really supposed to be, a baseball player, right? Um, so I have learned that, sure, 
I can be good at, you know, operating a company, but is that my, my best place? And there's, you know, certain things when you run a company, as you know, whether it's, you know, financials and HR and people and sales and, you know, processes and technology and all that stuff. I mean, you can't be good at everything, right? So I've been surprised to learn that although I'm, you know, I've, I've, I know that I'm a good bridge between like technology people and business people. I know I'm a quick start and all that kind of stuff. Um, but in my older age, I've gotten, um, a lot more aware of my weaknesses and how to solve for that by putting systems around me, um, to do maybe what I really don't like to do. And I didn't even really know that I don't like to do it. I was just a hard worker. But as soon as I figured that out, I was like, and this is kind of when me and you linked back up, but I went on LinkedIn for a while. And I started just posting a lot. I was like, I'm just going to do a lot of posting and get back out there. And then I realized that I had so much backend work because we were getting a ton of business that, you know, to your suggestion, I had to hire a person to help me, you know, schedule all the meetings and all that kind of stuff. Instead of me scheduling myself, like, man, having someone help me so that I could be in front of our customers and actually solving problems real time, like that's where I need to live even more and more and more. And as I've done that, uh, my company has matured because other people have stepped up the natural implementers and the follow through people and all those fact finders and all those types of people have actually kind of risen around me and said, Hey, Nick, don't worry. We'll, we'll go fact find and figure out what's wrong there and bring that solution back to you. So, um, you know, I think the the simple way to equate it is when you're a kid, um, you're going to be told, um, what you're good and bad at. You're, they're probably going to tell you you have ADD or focus issues or whatever. Don't listen to any of that crap. The the reality is, is they're right, but figure out how to turn that into a strength, not a weakness, right? Like if you have ADD, that just means you can think really fast and multitask and <laughs> you get bored with, you know, mundane things. Like use that to your advantage. Don't, don't go, you know, necessarily run off to the, the drugstore to, to treat it. Like figure out how to turn that into your superpower. Yeah. Well, that's from, I, I guess you're, you were an ADD, ADD kid. So was they, I. They, yeah, they, they told me that and I was like, whatever. Like, I like to think I'm, I'm happy with my brain. I'm happy with myself. So I'm just going to go do what I do and sorry, I don't fit in your box. You know? Yeah, no, I feel you. Okay, man, dude, Nick, um, I, I don't, I know that you do a lot of B2B biz dev on LinkedIn. I don't know how much you're out there, you know, trying to get your content out to the world, but like, what, is there any place you'd like to direct people, whether it's for professional services or just to follow you? Yeah. So, I mean, basically if you're doing anything on the phone, you're calling customers, any kind of B2C, B2B type business. I mean, just check out the website, whitel.com, see if that resonates with you. Um, there's a lot of problems, um, in the telephone ecosystem right now. Like if you're a business and making a call, that call could be accidentally labeled as spam. Guess what? Customers are never going to answer a call as spam. So, you know, we can help you with that. We're doing a lot of automation, uh, AI, text messaging, uh, virtual sales agents, all that kind of stuff. So but just visit ytel.com. And if any of that resonates with you, fill out the form. I also hop on the phone with uh, customers all the time. Happy to do that for your audience. And uh, thank you for having me on today, Jeff, man. It's been awesome. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And I'll just say, you know, and look, I, I'm not like, maybe I should have an affiliate link or something, but I don't. I'm, I actually am a client of Whitetail in two different businesses. I mean, I think, I think what Nick does um, is, is best to breed, not just in terms of the core technology and all the amazing different functions and, and features that it offers, but also the level of, the level of service you get, the level of, of business experience and versatility that you get of like, whatever type of business you are and whatever problem you're trying to solve, they've probably had that scenario or some version of it from 10 other clients that they've already solved. I mean, right now our developers are in a thread in our Slack with your developers working out pretty sophisticated data very. between yeah. our systems. You guys, are very, you guys have a very sophisticated setup and I love yeah. seeing that. And, and I've worked with other phone systems. I mean, uh, to be honest, like by the time this airs, like Ring Central, I'm not going to be Ring Central's favorite person because I'm about yep. to terminate a massive agreement with them. Yep. Because they don't do stuff like that. There's no personalization to the service. There's, There's no human connections. It's part of our part of our mission. Implementation support. Yeah. It's a real I'm a really big fan, Nick, of everything you put together. And and it bleeds through the people that we deal with. Like, like you said it, I can vouch for it. Your people love what they do. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Um, so regarding the referral link, I'm kind of thinking here, um, if, if everybody's I wasn't fishing to be clear, 
clear. No, I kind of like, well, here's the deal. We can give, we can give entree people, you know, even a higher touch and I'm willing to get on, you know, the phone at the right time. Um, so just again, visit our website and then put entree anywhere in that inquiry form and uh, we'll figure out how to get your customers even a little bit of a good deal. So I'll, I'll just add to that now that we've innovated this on the fly, this is entrepreneurship happening in real time. Put in, you can put, actually just make it the code UYP for unlock your potential because there's a lot of audience that doesn't necessarily come from the Entra customer base. Um, Say that one more time. Uh, UYP. UYP. How about this? Whitetail. Whitetail.com forward slash UYP. And by the time this airs, we'll have that link up. Done. Wow. Boom. I told you, responsive, personalized technology solutions. You just saw it on the flight. Nick, amazing, my friend. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I'm putting that link up right now. Ah, amazing. And of course, to all you viewers and listeners out there, as I tell you every time, you're the best part of this show. You're why I do what I do every single day. I'm so glad that we got to spend this time together with Nick, and I can't not wait to see you on the next one. Take care, everyone. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely going to love this one. Check it out. I want to feel like the smallest person in the room. Why? Proximity is power. One of the fastest ways to reset your identity is by being around other people physically, if you can, or at least in your thoughts, and it will transform your future.